Ole Kasik is co-founder of Airbnb. 300 million people use the online platform where they can rent private accommodation. With a simple idea and a thousand details, he became a millionaire. It all starts in 2007 with an air mattress. Jason lives with his buddies in a shared flat. The boys are broke and come up with an idea how they can improve their budget. The turning point comes when they are included in a funding program. With hard work and changes to the concept, their business gets rolling. Privately, Nathan is married to his wife Elizabeth. They have two children. Well, there's three of us that founded the company together. But before the company, we were roommates living in San Francisco in an apartment. And suddenly the rent on our apartment was raised 25%. And I said, that's too expensive, I'm moving out of here. But the other two guys, they wanted to stay, but they had just quit their jobs to become entrepreneurs, also known as unemployed. So they also didn't have the money to pay the rent. But they're both designers, and they saw that an international design conference was coming to San Francisco. And they saw that all the hotels were sold out. And so they had an idea, why not rent out that extra bedroom that I had vacated? Uh, about a year into it, uh, up until that point, we had had uh, a few people sign up uh, scattered throughout the U.S. But most of our customers, and by most I mean 30 or so, <laughs> were in New York. And we got some advice from one of our mentors, Paul Graham. He told us that uh, it's important to meet your users and that even as an internet company, it's okay to do things that don't scale. When you think internet company, you think, you know, it's all about scalability, you don't need to meet anybody. And he said, well, actually, when you're getting product market fit, it's really important to meet your customers. So he encouraged us to go spend our, our remaining few dollars to go to New York and start meeting our, our customers. And we thought, well, why will they meet with us? Why would they want to talk to us? And we, we had an observation that the profiles on our website, the photography wasn't very good, poor lighting. This was back in 2008 when the camera phones weren't very good. And so we'd call our early customers up and say, would you like a professional photographer to come to your home and take pictures for free? And so uh, most people were surprised by this invitation, but they, they said yes. And then they would get a knock on the door and it'd actually be Joe or Brian, my two co-founders, coming to take pictures themselves. Uh, so they were the professional photographers. Uh, and they, they took the pictures, but they also sat down uh, with the hosts and uh, showed them how to use the website, got product feedback, and we'd also invite uh, these hosts out uh, to have beers with us afterwards and get a few of them together. And over beers, we would kind of tell them our, our, our entrepreneurial story of the early days and the challenges and really build a relationship with our customers such that they really wanted us to succeed after they knew our story. And so this was really important because um, after doing this, we had really good photography, but we also had hosts that wanted us to succeed. Uh, meaning they were willing to adjust their prices, they were willing to let us help to write their profile pictures. And this was really a turning point for the company when things started to take off. This is early 2009. Uh, and, and basically, you know, everybody in the world wants to go to New York, uh, but it's very expensive. And now we had very attractive, very affordable properties. And so uh, they started getting booked. And guests would come, have a great experience, but then they would go home to Berlin, to Paris, wherever they came from. And they would tell their friends. And oftentimes, uh, the guests themselves would become hosts uh, in these other places. And so there was immediately kind of a global cross-pollination that occurred as a result of our focused effort in New York. We initially launched the website uh, in August of 2008 at the Democratic National Convention. This is when Barack Obama received the nomination of his party. And it was uh, a historic event. And a huge audience turnout was expected. And so uh, we, uh, we said, well, this is the perfect situation for Airbnb. People need an alternative place to stay. Uh, and, and that was our launch. And through that launch, we met a lot of political reporters, which was great. Uh, fast forward, though, a couple months later, and suddenly our business is not going so well. And we're thinking to ourselves, how can we uh, make use of this list of political reporters that we met to get more publicity for our concept? Well, we need something that's relevant for them. So at the time, the name of our company was Air Bed and Breakfast. Um, you know, because literally, when Joe, Brian, and I rented out the spare space in the apartment, we set up air beds. And so it's called Air Bed and Breakfast. And we thought, maybe we can do something funny with the breakfast portion of our name. And we came up with this concept to create a presidentially themed cereal. Because the election was about two months away. And we came up with this concept of uh, Obama O's. Uh, and the tagline, Hope in Every Bowl and uh, Captain McCain's, because John McCain 
was the other candidate for president. And we had a realization that even though we had spent a year and we'd worked very hard, we still hadn't given it 100%. And so we committed to working three more months on the concept. And during this time, we, uh, we enrolled in, and got into a program called Wide Combinator. And it's a well-known kind of accelerator program for startups. And so this was a bit of a rallying cry for us. And uh, it was over this period um, that things took off and that we went to New York uh, and took the pictures and, and the business actually started growing. And once the business started growing, it was then that we were able to successfully raise money. And our first investor was uh, Sequoia Capital. They uh, put in $600,000 uh, for 20% of the company. So uh, it might end up being one of the all-time highest uh, returns on an investment uh, someday. The three of us definitely believed the entire time, even when others laughed at us. Uh, we believed in the idea because of that story I told you about the first weekend. So we had seen the magic firsthand and we had seen the value proposition. And so it was just a question of how do we recreate that magic that happened that one weekend? And, and that was hard for sure, but we knew if we could recreate the magic that it made sense, that it was a win-win value proposition where uh, you know, the guests saved money, we made money, and actually everyone had a better time because of it. In the early days, the investors definitely, uh, they didn't like the idea. As I, as I mentioned, they, they said, this is not a product I would use. They said that um, this is, have to be a small market at most, and that, you know, what about safety? And so, uh, you know, they weren't interested from a financial perspective, and even going to some of our, our, our mentors, you know, I remember one of our mentors saying, I hope that's not the only thing you're working on. That wasn't a lot of encouragement uh, back then. Um, even my dad, actually, uh, a couple years in, he would always ask questions like, so how much longer do you think you'll work on this? You know, he's kind of like, you know, it wasn't a, a directly critical question, but kind of indirectly suggested that, you know, maybe this isn't that big of an idea or a long-term thing. We had a vision and we believed in it. And so it was, of course, disappointing when others didn't see that. But, you know, we pushed on. And I think that's really important, actually, uh, because... Whenever you do something new, it's only normal that others are gonna laugh at you because if they weren't laughing at you, that someone would have already done it already. And so I think it is just um, you know, part of the normal process um, and perseverance is really important. Paul Graham, who again is one of our mentors and he's the founder of this program, Y Combinator, that we went through. He has uh, a saying, he, said, he says, uh, startups die of uh, of uh, suicide, not homicide. In other words, they die of self-inflicted wounds, usually just because uh, they give up um, or the team falls apart. And so it does come down to perseverance and it, it comes down to the founding team sticking together. That is also a common scenario where the team, when the going gets tough, the team kind of fractures. And if, if the team falls apart when a company is young, the company usually falls apart too. Well, we always believed in the concept, but of course that whole first year was extremely difficult. And even at the end of the first year, we were thinking about quitting. Uh, you know, fast forward a few months later, and when we raised that first investment money from Sequoia Capital, I mean, things changed. I mean, one, we had some growth, so that was, gave us confidence. But the idea that Sequoia Capital, which is really the number one venture capital firm in the world, you know, very famous reputation, suddenly wanted to invest in us. This was such a change in fortune because we went from nobody being willing to take a second meeting to now the number one firm wanting to invest that you know, we immediately felt like you know, we were onto something special. Uh, and, and, and subsequently, you know, there was a tremendous growth story that literally you know, every month and every year, uh, the company uh, grew wildly in the early days by 5x, 4x, 3x, 2x, um, and is still growing today, obviously. It's been 10 years. And now 300 million guests have stayed in other people's homes. So it's rather mind-boggling. Um, but you know, I think for us, what's amazing isn't so much the growth story, but it's, it was that turning point in the early days where we went from so much rejection to suddenly uh, you know, things clicking and the growth happening and the investment happening. That was a real change in fortune. <laughs> Well, uh, of course, very proud. Um, I think what I'm most proud of, though, and, and, and most, um, most feel most good about is when I meet uh, members of our host community. And uh, you know, this could be somewhere very far away, like in India, for example. 
and you ask someone, you know, what, what, does, what does Airbnb mean to you? You know, tell me your favorite Airbnb story. Uh, and you just hear incredible stories about how the thing that you created impacted someone's life positively. And so that is something that always makes uh, me feel really good about what we've accomplished. I mean, the numbers, of course, are really big and, and those feel good too, but the human stories always touch you more. Uh, and to think that you could have that kind of impact on someone you know, you've never met before, somewhere very far away, uh, is, is a very cool thing. I actually had a, uh, someone from Berlin just check out the other day. Uh, so that was kind of funny because I'm here in Berlin and they had come from Berlin to San Francisco. Uh, but yes, I have people in my house most nights. Uh, this is a kind of a guest suite, so it does have a separate entrance. Sometimes I meet the guests, sometimes I don't. Uh, over the last three or four years, I've probably had about over 500 guests now stay there uh, if you add it all up. So a lot of people. And it's my way of just staying close to the product experience, you know, to have that firsthand understanding of what does it take to be a host every single night? Um, you know, how do you handle the logistics? Uh, always using the product. That's how I stay really connected to the business. You know, one funny story is uh, uh, a German reporter stayed with me whom I had actually met like three or four years before. It was the f actually one of my first interviews uh, outside of the US. This is back in like 2011. And uh, so she booked my place not knowing it was me because uh, my profile is somewhat discreet. And uh, she needed some extra towels. So I, I came down to bring her the towels and then she realized who I was and I realized who she was. And it was just this really funny connection because in the early days when she had done the interview, it was a very tough interview. I mean, back then we were nobody. Uh, and here we were trying to launch in the German market and there was 101 reasons why we weren't going to be successful, uh, which you know, during the interview she reminded me of. But then three years later, a lot had changed at that point. And it was really funny that she was actually an Airbnb guest now staying in my house. So that was fun. So I started with computers at a very young age. My dad is an electrical engineer, so we had computers in the house. This is like in the mid-90s, uh, so a different time than we live in now. But we had a, a computer in the house, and you know, I, uh, you know, at that time I was playing a lot of computer games. But one day I was homesick from school, and uh, I took a book off my dad's bookshelf, and he had books about computers, and I started flipping through it. And in that book were basic uh, instructions on how to write simple computer programs. And so I started doing this as a hobby, and I started getting, buying books uh, and, and teaching myself how to program. And I was, uh, I was posting some of my work on the internet, the very early internet. And I said, you know, if you like what I've posted, send me $5. Well, no one ever sent me $5, but one day, uh, a couple years later, at the age of 14, somebody called me and said, I, I really like what you wrote. I want you to write me something similar, and I'll pay you $1,000 to do it. So I told my dad, somebody from the internet wants to pay me $1,000. And he said, son, nobody from the internet is going to pay you $1,000. That's a scam. And I said, whatever, dad. I, you know, this is my hobby. I'll do it anyways, and we'll see what happens. And uh, sure enough, 30 days later, I got paid $1,000. Uh, which as a 14-year-old is pretty exciting and it was pretty validating. But perhaps more importantly, uh, he introduced me to other people who needed similar things. And this began a business that I ran for about four years uh, in high school. Uh, I made almost a million dollars doing this, actually. Uh, but more important than that was the self-confidence that that created in myself, that I could teach myself all the necessary skills and that I could build things that other people valued. And I think from that, I took away that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of what prepared me later on to, to do this. Oh, I think I saved most of it. I think I still have most of it. <laughs> um, I paid for college. It's probably the most expensive thing that I did with my, my, my early money. My parents, um, I don't think they totally understood exactly what I was doing. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, early internet days, and so, you know, all this was very new, and, and, and my dad was an electrical engineer, and he kind of understood it, but my mom certainly has no technical background. Uh, you know, they were just very supportive parents, uh, and, and they, you know, were supportive of, of, you know, giving me the space to run the business out of the house, and, uh, you know, at one point I had 20 or 40 computers in the basement, so I kind of really took over the entire basement. Um, so, very supportive, very proud, um, but I also don't think they really understood what was going on. <laughs> no. Well, even now, they, they probably don't understand everything about Airbnb. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, 
you know, there's the story about the first year and how difficult that was. And then there was a number of years of, of rapid growth. And then 2011 came. And 2011 was a very challenging year. Um, you know, one thing that happened was, you know, we had this incredible growth story. And in that year, we raised $100 million at a uh, $1.3 billion valuation. So the valuation of the company the year before had been about 76 million. And then one year later, it was 1.3 billion. Uh, and so a huge jump, huge amount of money raised. Um, you know, we were feeling really great about ourselves, but a bunch of other challenges arose. Uh, you know, with so much success, you kind of get built up onto a pedestal and then everything goes wrong. And, you know, one thing that went wrong was suddenly a bunch of competition emerged. Other people saw the success and they wanted to, uh, to emulate it and, and to do that in their own markets. And here in, uh, in Europe and in Germany specifically, two companies emerged. Uh, one was a company called Wimdu. Another was a company called Nine Flats. Uh, both started by uh, you know, well-known entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs. Uh, and you know, at that time, you know, most of our business was in the US. And these uh, new companies wanted to be Airbnb, but in Europe. And so suddenly the race was on. And uh, at that time, we had only 40 employees. And uh, one of these companies actually claimed to have 400 employees. Uh, and so we we're like, what just happened? Uh, you know, suddenly, uh, despite all our fast growth, you know, we really uh, haven't scaled the company quickly enough. And so we, uh, we went on a hiring spree and we ended up opening a bunch of offices throughout Europe because we wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't simply an American company, we wanted to be a local company. And so we created uh, local offices uh, in each of these uh, countries. And we had one in Berlin uh, and in Hamburg and in Paris and Barcelona, et cetera. And we hired local people there. And uh, this really began um, you know, a race that lasted a couple of years. Uh, ultimately, you know how the story ended. Uh, we, we, we did very well. Um, by the end of that year, 2011, though, we had 400 people. So we went through a tremendous hypergrowth. It was also during this period that uh, we had our first kind of major kind of trust and safety uh, crisis. Uh, you know, somebody's apartment uh, in San Francisco uh, got vandalized and it became a very high profile event. And, you know, we weren't staffed correctly to handle it well. And so we made a few mistakes. And because we had just raised all this money and we had been built up and put on a pedestal, you know, uh, folks were really, really ready to be very critical and say, you know, I told you so, so this is a very bad idea. And so, you know, we, we really uh, felt a lot of heat. Of course, we made some mistakes, uh, but it was, it was a painful moment. It was a moment in which you wondered, you know, is the company going to survive this or will this create a crisis of confidence that is insurmountable? Uh, and so all this was happening at the same time. We were you know, raising money, having this crisis, and trying to expand from 40 to 400 and open all these offices in Europe. Uh, so you know, that was probably the, the most kind of pivotal and challenging year. You know, in that moment, ultimately, we had to fully own our mistakes and, and be completely honest and, and humble about it. Uh, but um, that was one component. The other component was we had to make material changes. And the material changes was we took the entire company at the time and focused them on building and creating trust and safety features uh, for the period of two to three weeks. And over that period of time, we actually came up with 40 initiatives uh, to improve the trust and the safety of the website. And so out of that came things like 24-7 customer support, uh, a dedicated trust and safety team, our host guarantee, which is now a million dollar host guarantee. Um, uh, so you know, the crisis made us think harder about the challenges of our business and got us to think more creatively. And ultimately, we came out a much stronger company uh, as a result. Well, I think a lot of that uh, criticism is unfair. Uh, in other words, uh, if you look at the trend in many cities, uh, rents, et cetera, have been increasing for a long period of time. And so this is part of the expected trend. At the same time, of course, a lot of people uh, you know, are upset about that. Uh, and, and they point to Airbnb as a high profile company uh, and, and, and look at what is happening and, and say we are uh, a contributor to that. Uh, there have been some studies on this. They're not particularly conclusive. Uh, there's a lot of different reports out there. 
you know, that being said, uh, you know, we want to be uh, we want to be good partners uh, with uh, cities, uh, and we we want to be responsible actors. Uh, and so, you know, we certainly think that there should be regulation uh, in, in in markets, and and we are. Uh, understanding that different cities are going to want different things. Uh, and so we really try to partner with cities and uh, understand their needs and, 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 and partner with them to make the regulation successful. Uh, to date, we've had in about 400 different markets, uh, different partnerships created, different policies passed uh, to define what is responsible home sharing. Uh, and and this, is, this is in recognition that home sharing actually makes housing more affordable, certainly for those who participate in the activity. So many people say that they depend on uh, you know, paying their rent or paying their mortgage because of their Airbnb income. So it can be actually a huge enabler, but of course there needs to be guardrails to make sure that it's not uh, abused or taken too far. And so that's what the policies aim to do. Uh, and I think we're striking that balance in many different places. Here in Berlin, there has been you know, very strict regulation historically. And right now there's policies going through the legislative process uh, that will finally recognize uh, home sharing and make home sharing easy while still making sure that uh, speculators and such can't take it too far. Um, and uh, you know, the other thing that we've uh, committed to doing is uh, tax partnerships where we will help collect the tourist tax uh, so that you know, cities can benefit uh, from, from home sharing and tax it just as they would a hotel, for example. And so we have a partnership uh, with, in, in Germany with uh, the city of Dortmund uh, but we have four, uh, hundreds of these around the world, and to date we've collected more than 500 million U.S. dollars in uh, incremental tourism tax revenue that has gone to cities. And so, you know, actually I think home sharing isn't just good for hosts, it's really good uh, for cities as well. And um, more and more, a very responsible way of doing this has been defined, and, you know, home sharing is being legitimized. Well, my wife and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, we, we've been together since the start of college. So what was that? That was uh, 17 years ago. Wow, that sounds like a really long time. And we've been married for eight years. Uh, so we have a, a good track record that predates the company by quite some time. So she's pretty used to me at this point. Uh, and also, you know, uh, she, uh, has been a part of the entire lifespan of the company. Um, you know, obviously, there's never enough time in the day, um, but you know, I think having a a a serious uh, relationship a, a means that you have to uh, make time for your private life, which I think is ultimately healthy. I mean, there's never enough time, but actually, that tension is a is a healthy thing. And, and today, I now have two kids, and so you know, even more. So you know, I I put a lot more time into my private life now, uh, and that just means that in terms of my my business life. I just have to be uh, you know, more careful of my time. I have to prioritize more uh, and be more efficient, which is ultimately a good thing. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think the two can be complementary. I would say I work 50 hours a week or so. Um, you know, in the office, actually, I'm probably there less than 40 hours a week. Uh, you know, the nice thing in my position is I have a lot of flexibility to work from home and work after the kids go to sleep and such. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, I actually think it's, it's, it's quite great, you know, it, um, that I can, my wife is a doctor, she works a lot of nights and weekends, um, but, you know, if she's working, I can be home, uh, regardless of when that time is, so I have a lot of flexibility. You know, on the other hand, I have to do a lot of business travel, too. I'm taking on an additional title. I'm chief strategy officer, but I'm also uh, chairman of Airbnb China, so I oversee our China business, which means I go there quite often, and that's obviously a big-time commitment. Well, these days, it's, it's my, uh, my new son who is still less than one and isn't the best sleeper. So, you know, more of that is on the private side than the business life. Uh, you know, these nights, uh, these days with, um, with the business, you know, I think uh, it's, a, it's a much larger operation. And, and the good part of that is that there's someone to take care of everything. So in the early days, every fire, every, everything kind of emergency that came up, you know, someone else, we would ultimately have to handle it. And so you're always on call. Now, you know, there's a, a capable team that can handle all that. At the same time, with such a big organization, it could be hard to keep track of everything going on. And so sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And it's, it's increasingly important to kind of audit the organization. Um, and, and so, you know, that was what would keep me up at night is maybe not knowing what I don't know uh, about the company. 
Well, I still think it's actually very early days for Airbnb. It's been 10 years, so, so a while, and yet the potential has never been so clear. I think there's so much more as a company we can be doing, uh, both in terms of growing our core business, but expanding out into new things like, like uh, uh, experiences, which we now offer. So I see a lot of potential. I'm obviously very passionate um, about the, the concept in this space. And um, it's still interesting for me. I'm, I'm still learning and being challenged. And so all three of us founders are actually still 100% engaged in the company, which is actually a very rare thing after th uh, 10 years. Uh, and so you know, I don't expect anything to change in the long term in terms about my personal engagement with the company. And I think there's going to be a lot more innovation and growth. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I'm not going anywhere.